Welcome everyone. Thanks for hanging out on a pretty crazy day. Hopefully wherever you are, things are um, going good for you and yours. Absolute insanity. What's happened over the last week? Um, awesome, Dustin. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, we're super interested in doing more C4D character animation stuff this year. So we built the rigs and we're going to talk about talk about that stuff today. So if I'm looking down, it's because I'm also uh, live switching the broadcast here on my little iPad. I think everything is set up. I'm just going to kind of chill for a second. Please let me know if it's like super loud and I'm overpowering you with my voice. It should be uh, pretty decently dialed in. I'm going to keep my chat up. So let's go here. Um, so thanks for hanging out, y'all, whatever you all are up to. Maybe lunch break for some, a little earlier on the West Coast. Uh, first live stream for me in quite a while. It's been a wild year. Um, so, so many new courses, many new things. Um, but things are a little more settled, so we're building out. Hopefully you're on this uh, web page here on the MoGraph Mentor website. You might be on YouTube watching this. Um, let's actually just go back for a second. Um, on this page, if you want to go download these rigs that I'm going to play with, you can just go directly under this video embed and you'll see a download the project files and that's just going to take you to the free, uh, the free rigs for all that stuff. So I'm just going to make sure, um, everything's looking good on the stream, streaming good, all that stuff. And then we'll uh, we'll just geek out on on Cinema 4D for a few minutes today. <clears throat> okay. So going for a Florida man vibe. I am here in Sarasota, Florida. Got the steel drum music on Alexa, which we will stop. Because it's... Oh, Alexa, stop. Okay. Um, new hashtag Florida man set here. I've got my fake plants. Um, got my neon sign. I found this super cool pinwheel with flamingos that I'm super into. Got the diffuser, keeping the immune system, uh, the immune system up. Um, so, one of the things I'm most excited about that we put together... Um, with the MoGraph Mentor recently um, are these two rigs, and we're calling them Bo and Iggy. I've got, oops, um, you can always hold down Command and drag these HUD windows around. That's probably going to be a useful thing to know as you play with these rigs. Um, and everything should work really smoothly. I don't know if anybody was on the thread where I was debating buying a new PC or a new Mac, a new iMac, and I did buy a new iMac Pro. Um, I'm just too busy, too slammed to want to mess with PC stuff right now. The iMac Pro is, um, is a really, really great machine. So that's what I'm working on here, um, today. So, you know, we've got Bo and, uh, we've got Iggy and I'll go ahead and open a scene file with him as well. Maybe this, this kind of walk cycle I was playing with. And, you know, there's a real bottleneck in trying to do character work in Cinema 4D, and that's rigs. And for years, I would search, and there's like a couple of people who were building pretty decent rigs, um, but also they were like pretty easy to break, typically, and it just didn't feel like a really serious solution um, to doing character work in cinema. Um, and as someone who started in my, uh, in character work as my original introduction into, you know, the whole world of animation... Um, it's nice to see cinema kind of investing in the character animation tools. It's nice to see more people with rigging knowledge, like Joey, people who are really going deep on rigging in cinema. Brett Bay is another, um, you know, Maya and C4D, uh, rigger who's going really, really deep. Um, so if we want to get better at character stuff, we do need some rigs. So if you want to download those rigs, they're below this video. If you're on the MoGraph Mentor page, if you're watching this on YouTube, go over to the live stream page um, or go find the free rigs um, over on MoGraphMentor.com. So 
you know, we wanted to start simple too, where there's like a ball rig where you can do some really cool squash and stretch stuff in MoGraph Mentor. Um, when you're initially learning animation, um, we start with a ball bounce. So if you've been in the MoGraph Mentor program, you know this already, um, where, let me come back to, to Bo here. Um, and let me actually pull up uh, the little bounce that I was working on with this guy. Um, and I would love for students to be able to use Cinema 4D more so to do it, but you need a pretty good ball rig. You can't really just you can't really just change the anchor point um, on a sphere and that really be a good enough solution. You could probably do that and fidget with it and make that work. Um, but we wanted there to be a good rig. So in the future, if students want to do their ball bounce assignment in 3D because they have a more of a 3D focus, uh, that's one of the reasons I really wanted to like spend some money and some time to build a ball rig, which seems like a simple thing. Um, but, you know, hats off to, um, to Joey Judkins for just kind of going deeper and building something that would be more intuitive and a little bit easier to use. So this was the, um, this was the animation here that I was putting together. <clears throat> and I guess basically the big thing was having a master controller that always stays flush to the ground, um, having a bounce controller so I can get him off the master controller, having a kind of rotation cage on the ball that is also separate, um, and having a squash and stretch controller that is kind of pinned to the bottom of the sphere. So even if I rotate it, my um, kind of the, the basis of the squash and stretch stays fixed to this bottom point. And a lot of stuff I would have never been able to really figure out, but as Joey was testing it, this was kind of the solution he came up with, um, which I think is which I think is good. Um, so I'll occasionally check, uh, check on the chat if you have any questions or comments. Um, I'll, I'll kind of check in a little bit. Right now I'm just going to um, go ahead and work on a new animation. So first things first, I'm in C4D R21. Um, if you're a MoGraph Mentor student or you're taking one of our workshops, you can get an educational license as well. I'm using an educational license. Maxon is quite generous letting us use their software um, for purposes like this. And the first thing I did to set up my scene is to just make sure I'm using the animate layout. Of course, you can customize your layout, but the default animation is pretty good where it blows up the timeline and uh, and then it's going to just bring my uh, my objects and the object properties over here on the right. And then the picture viewer here. Excuse me, slamming coffee all morning. So as I said before, if you if you're on the master control for bow, there's this HUD, and you may want to move it around when you're animating. If you hold control, hold down control, and then click with your mouse, you can move the position of the HUD. And so the master controller does have my squash and stretch linked, as I said, that stays kind of pinned to the bottom, so that even a stretch pose and a little bit, I guess we need some like some banking rotation to show that. You'll see that as I bank him rotationally, that that squash and stretch is staying pinned to the bottom. It's not like it's totally attached to his body, which could get into some weirdness, but it's also um, it's also kind of useful for quick stuff. And you can double click on the values of a HUD and, and do like I just did there, like zero it out. Um, in terms of the blink, it's just a single switch here. So if I click on the word, that is actually going to activate Joey's little espresso rig here and do a blink. If I click on the stop on the circle rather, that's actually going to lay a keyframe. So you can see I laid the keyframe there on blink. Uh, there at zero, I could go I could go forward, you know, two frames, lay another keyframe. First I need to actually open his eyes, then lay a keyframe. And you'll see we've got the blink animation. I can grab those um, and just delete those. So obviously if you're new to Cinema 4D, the big impediment to doing your animation is obviously your animation principles, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but also just using the timeline. And there's two modes to the Cinema 4D timeline. One they call the dope sheet, I believe, unless that's been updated. And then the other is our F-curves editor. Right now I'm looking at the, the dope sheet, which is just 
my keyframes represented as little squares. And this is great for timing stuff. We could say, actually, that blink needs to be all the way out here. His eyes are closed. They open here. This is great for general timing. Um, but of course, I can't manipulate the interpolation, right? I don't have any curves here. And over here on the left, you'll see I can just switch to F-curve mode if I select that and um, hit H. Now, there's not going to be any curves on the blink, is there? Uh, because it's just a single switch and we're using Expresso to control that. Uh, but as we lay some some real keyframes, um, we're gonna see we're gonna see that get updated. So uh, the scene looks so cool when rendered, crazy with the colors and this, it all look good together. Thank you. Hello, Chris. How are you, sir? Hopefully, staying healthy and safe out in um, in California. Just, just crazy, crazy stuff going down. So let's go ahead and animate. If I hit H on my keyboard and I've got my viewer selected, it's gonna frame my character. Let's just very quickly do a bounce so we can talk a little bit more about the editor. So again, as we're saying, the master controller is the ground plane. This, this layer called bow bounce is what we wanna use uh, to move him off the ground plane and it's, you see, I actually don't have him all the way down, do I? And that's on me. Put his master controller down. The nice thing about this is just that the bounce property, like we're typically just gonna use the Y parameter, right? To, to go up and down. We're not really ever gonna use X and Z on this. Maybe on version two, we'll like constrain that in a more elegant way. Um, but we're just gonna primarily work on the Y. And the great thing about keeping the master controller on the ground plane is obviously, is zeroing out that property and bringing him back flush. So that's why we wanted to separate that as opposed to kind of building it into a single thing. So let's say that it's going to be a stationary bounce. Um, and let's actually start kind of up in the air. Now, if I hold control and click on this circle, it's going to lay a keyframe. Um, and that was actually, I think the old version, you always had to hold control. Now in R21, I believe I can just literally click this and you see there's like a little circle that activates around it and I can just click it to lay a keyframe. So let's start there. We will go to 12 frames, zero that out, click it again. I can see now I've got my animation started. I'll go to 24 and let's actually just Commands, can I do that in the dope sheet? I cannot. Let's actually go to my F curve editor. So here in my Y property, I'm gonna to swap to F curves. And I almost exclusively work in this mode because let's see, Command C, Command V. I'm just gonna copy and paste that first, uh, that first position. So if I take my timeline down to just like, I guess if we want a perfect loop, we have to go right to 24, don't we? And so, this is what I really, really love about the curve editor is just being able to um, copy paste keyframes, move things around. And then obviously um, one of the big things is just getting comfortable with how this interface works. If I hold the number one on the keypad and click, I kind of reframe the whole thing. If I hold two and I push my mouse up and down, I click the mouse and push up and down or left to right, it's kind of like a scaling effect um, on the timeline. And this is useful when you're getting in there and you want to examine really, really, really small details. So you've got to get a little bit used to the one and two. And if I hit H, it'll frame the, it'll frame the keyframes that I have, right? What, on whatever layer I have selected. Um, so I'm going to pull back out just a little bit here. And this is where we can also examine a little bit of the height of the bounce. So these are my Y axis. I could grab them both and move them way up. So let's do something a little bit more exaggerated. We'll move that up, we'll hit H again, and we can kind of get a feel for just how extreme we're gonna go in the Y axis. So that's good. Um, the next thing we wanna do is work on the timing of this animation, because this certainly doesn't feel like a bounce, and we should be able to visually see in our keyframes, this is kind of like an ease in, ease out on all my keyframes, right? He's easing into this 
zero position and then kind of easing back up, what we actually want to do is break this tangent. You'll see that if I just try to grab it, the tangent is connected. Um, so what I need to do is come over here and I'm going to make this, um, nope, actually not linear. What I'm actually going to do to break this tangent is just hold shift on my keyboard and grab one of the handles. And while I'm holding shift, I can break this tangent and manipulate the interpolation on both sides of that. And I'm going to frame this down a little bit so I can see the nature of my curves here. So you see, we've dramatically changed the animation now, right? Like it definitely feels a lot more like a bounce. Uh, people talking Blender. We did just have a new Blender course launch today. That is an inter intermediate course. If you've never used Blender, um, we recommend go take a Blender interface intro overview, um, and then go check out then go check out Remington's course. But Blender is just a, a mind-blowingly good tool, and big thanks to Remington for for teaching us teaching us about it. So these are, that might even just be a little crazy. I'm gonna pull back on that ever so slightly because I don't want it to feel like he's, he's stuck in the air for too long. And I can see my keyframes actually on 23 um, and I want it to be on 24. And I'm holding down shift to constrain there and hit spacebar and we can watch that back a little bit. So the next um, the next layer that we should add, and that's really the way to think about working with the rig, is coming at your animation in layers. Obviously, first we need a plan and a sketch. We're going to do a simple bounce, um, so it's not quite as crucial. But if I come to the master controller, let's animate the squash and stretch. So I'm going to lay a keyframe. Uh, I'm going to keep the blink. Uh, no, I'm going to keep the bounce and the squash and stretch. And if you see over here on the left side of my timeline menu, I can, I can like control select multiple properties or individual properties. So like if I wanna see position Y and squash and stretch all in the same view, I can, I can do that. Um, so he's not gonna really have any deformation at the top of the bounce. And right about here, he would kind of reach peak velocity. So let's go 100%, let's be super exaggerated. And I'm a big believer in contact frames, so we are going to add some contact frames. Uh, but first, I'm just going to put this. I'm going to put this first animation in, and go ahead and do a keyframe. So now he kind of stretches. Now we still need to put the squash in, um, but a single frame on the ground is not really going to be enough time in my opinion, to really make the squash playful. So what I want to do is say, actually, let's go ahead and put this here at 11 frames in. And I want to keep him on the ground for two frames. So I'm going to copy and paste that. And then I'm going to hit, uh, I got to go to this side. Oh, are we not doing Alt L anymore? Option L. So what I can just do on that hold frame is just create a step and basically say, don't give me any interpolation because the Y, the y value is just static, right? So now we're going to have a little bit more room to play with. So I'll come back to squash and stretch. I'll hit H to frame this up. And so really, there's this frame here where he stretches. Now he's here. This is my, this is my contact frame. And then we're going to come back out of that with a stretch. So first thing I'm gonna do is copy and paste again. So those values are the same. And then on the middle frame, I'm gonna squash down 100% and lay a keyframe. And I'm gonna end up with something that looks like this. And this is just what I mean by contact frames is adding extra frames to even give our, our eyes a chance to catch the squash. And you see just one, you know, just that one extra contact frame actually isn't super great. Like we should probably exaggerate it um, even a little bit more. So if we come back to our Y property and hit H, let's like really exaggerate this. Let's pull it out yet again. <laughs> you can see the animation looks funny. 
but we can just mirror that and say, we just want to add a little bit more of these contact frames. And you see now it's less like almost a blinking animation of just the squash turning on and off in a single frame. It looks like he's easing in a little bit more. And so that is helpful. And we can really examine how we feel about it. I think one issue is we're probably easing into this squash a little bit much. It should probably be a little bit more violent than that, right? Like the force should get down into that pretty quickly. Um, so I am going to extend out the squash pose so we get to it a little bit quicker. And so now we've got, we've got like a cute little bounce going. So the next thing we can do, let's add another layer of animation. Um, yeah, let's come to this rotate layer. As I said before, this like rotational cage. Um, and we'll go back to, let's go to like, eh, let's go to zero. Um, and on the rotate, sometimes I just like to play with the values first and just see, okay, pitch is more like an X rotate bank. It's a little bit more of that like Z axis. Let's have him rotate kind of like I did in my little uh, teaser promo animation. Let's have him like do a spin. Um, so we're at zero to begin with. We're going to need to get to 360 degrees. That's going to be probably really fast. He's going to look like a, he's going to look like a ballerina, which is kind of cool, <clears throat> like really exaggerating and pushing the timing and stuff and making him seem super athletic was one of the things I was having more fun with, with this rig, um, doing these really you know, these really fluttering spins look kind of nice with the squash and stretch. So that's kind of cool. Um, so we get that little, get that little rotation, but maybe it makes more sense. Let me come into that rotation animation. And maybe it makes more sense to move this whole animation um, after the bounce. Like maybe he gets his he gets his, um, oh, I need to hold shift to just constrain my values. Maybe he uses the floor. Yeah, that's probably. And it probably, the timing should probably feel like it, it does match up. Um, so the other thing we can do, he's easing into the spin and reaching like peak spin. If we actually more mirror the bounce, I wonder if that's gonna look better. And it feels like the the inertia is coming off the bounce for the rotate there. You know, we did it and I actually like it a little bit less. I think it was kind of cool that he did it on the first bounce. And of course we could, um, you know, we could add both. We go back to our bow bounce layer and say something like negative 360. Um, but actually, again, Command C, Command V, just copy and paste. Do a little bit of zoom, scaling, hold Shift. But in reality, we probably want him to like spin the other way, so there's a little variety. So let's go back to that bow bounce. And if I actually double click the keyframe, I could I can enter values manually as well, which is kind of helpful. So because it's coming this way, oops, shift. So now it's like one big long rotation where he kind of stops in the middle, which is potentially cool. So when I was working on the promo animation, this is basically how I started of just this kind of stationary bounce. Um, I wanted to do several bounces and try to give myself a little bit more of a challenge, several seconds, and also do some like stopping and starting, I think is, is a good, is, was a good animation challenge to like really try to work on the, 
the timing on that on that bounce have him do a little antic in the shot kind of look both ways and then do do that rotation like that anticipation rotation a squash anticipation a couple of frames maybe four five six four five six frames and then right into right into these stretchy gooey gooey bounces that we can do with this guy which i think is rad So <clears throat> that is pretty easy to add. If we want to add a little bit, our, our animation is looking a little bit slower, but that's okay. I think the next thing we can play with um, is this, is this, uh, well, yeah, let's play with the master controller, actually. So if we come back to the master controller, our, our blink and all that, comes back up um, maybe we could add like a cute maybe he like closes his eyes as he's descending so I'll bring up my I gotta go back to the dope sheet for the for the blinks um, You know, the blinks are tough. The blinks are interesting because they just happen. It's really a switch that's turning turning off one layer and turning on another. So you can't really like, um, you can't really treat it like a traditional um, animation. It's got that more stop motion. We'll kill the blink for now, just so we don't get too bogged down in that. So let's try some position stuff. Let's put him over here in the master controller. So now we really are using X, Y, and Z on the master controller, right? Oops. And man, some of this stuff, some of these tweaks are interesting. So we've got some keyframes there. Let's just go to the end of our animation come back in here and we only used X. So we're just gonna have a single. And this was probably the biggest challenge in the first animation that I did was adding this layer of the overall position. And it could just be as simple as, um, so let's go to our X position, hit H to frame it. Um, it needs to probably feel much more motivated than this, right? This is just feels like kind of a random easing in, easing out. If we select all and hit Alt L or Option L, that's the keyboard shortcut to change our keyframes from easing interpolation to a linear interpolation. And so now we have like a constant rate of speed on that. which just gives you a ton of control. So kind of back and forth this way. Let's actually move him a little bit forward in space as well. And I guess you're really only ever using X and Z on this property here. Command A, Alt L. The X position is already linear. So obviously we need to plan out a shot and like decide where he needs to be in the blocking and the staging and all that good stuff. But that just gives you a sense of um, how to go about layering it. And maybe there's, you know, depending on the shot, maybe the first thing you would move is the blocking and you would kind of maybe just do a blocking positional pass and then go in and add your bounces and, and do all that kind of, all that kind of fun stuff. I'd say for now, um, I'm gonna bring open no, what I actually want is the X, Y, and Z keyframes. Hit Command A, and I'm just going to delete those. Because I don't have a, a better blocking plan already, let's not get let's not get bogged down in that. 
So let's just bring him back to the middle. So we've got this cute bounce. Let's let's come to a landing. Let's come to a stop. Um, let's take a look. So I'm going to add some more time back here in my timeline. Right now I only have 24 frames in view. Let's take that to something like 40. I'll extend that out, give ourselves a little bit of room. And, you know, the bounce animation is really kind of the big driver here. So we got this cute bounce. He comes back up to his normal position. I'm going to make sure all my end keyframes are on 24 there. Nothing on the blink. Squash and stretch is on 24. That's all good. So what we need to do now is get him back to the floor. Um, so that was about 11 frames, so 24 to 35. I'll grab that keyframe and bring him back to the ground. So he's up. So it could be kind of cute. There's like this big spin, this big squash and stretch, and then a big, a big landing. And so again, we need to come back to our squash and stretch and just try to think through kind of how this would be. And I'm going to mostly use my squash and stretch with a little bit of the Y uh, bounce to try to create like a cool little landing. So again, it's coming up here. Around 35, he lands. So I'll grab this keyframe here. Command C, Command V. That's probably that easing. I think is okay. I don't know about that easing though. So, so we see he kind of his deformation is back to zero, and he's he's picking up speed here. Uh, let's see how far we can get by just using the squash and stretch controller. So here, the very, let's say two frames from now, he's back to zero, lay a keyframe. Um, actually, excuse me, he needs to be at 100 on the squash. And I need to lay a keyframe. So, da -dump. so he's gonna come down then in another, let's actually space that out a little bit. Let's say it takes him three frames, goes down into that squash. Three frames later, he shoots, not 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 a hundred percent, but a little bit like so, because what we want to do is like a, like a little bit of a bounce easing out. So like a little like let's try to achieve that with just kind of the squash and stretch. And I can already see 40 frames isn't going to be enough, so I'll add a, a ton. I'll add another 20 so I don't run out of space again on this. You can kind of see how we're getting there. Now from here, I'm just going to copy and paste keyframes. Um, so there he goes negative, uh, you know, what, 100% on the squash. We don't quite want that. This should almost, we should be able to visually, visually see the decay here. And I'm going to actually break that tangent because that's a little bit too extreme. And we'll come back and examine and see if it's just way too slow. And now I should be able to really visually see. You can kind of see how the blocking is going to get us there. Doop, doop, doop. And, but then he's got to get back to zero. Uh, and it's looking a little janky because we need to smooth some things out and perhaps look at our timing a bit. But this is also what I really love about working in the curve editor is like to be able to see things like this visually to me makes a lot of sense. And so I can see my decay visually um, as opposed to continually going back up to this slider and controller and doing that whole thing. So let's see how, how we're doing on a first block. First pass. So some funny stuff going on here. Um, our rotation now looks janky because um, it feels like it probably needs to be eased a little more. Although it's eased a bit. I think we need to just make that a little bit more. 
And this might be a, a kind of instance where we need to do a little bit of overshoot, another animation principle. So I'm gonna Command C, Command V. I'm gonna bring that down. I'm gonna add a slight overshoot animation, which actually, excuse me, we're gonna overshoot. We actually have to go the right direction. And I'm gonna hold Shift to break this tangent because I like the easing on the one side, but the other side now. So, you know, I'm not thinking about this clearly. If we're really gonna overshoot, we just need to overshoot on the core position. So we'll have them go to like 400. Command C, Command V, pull this way in. And then double click and bring that back. So there's my, there's my little overshoot. And you can see that might be a touch extreme. And this is where the, the one and two on the keypad, um, excuse me, and this whole zooming uh, actually does become kind of important. So that 400, that looks a little too far. I wanted something way more subtle. And it's happening too quickly, that's the other thing. Doesn't feel quite right, so. Maybe a little bit of an overshoot. You know, it's interesting, it gives him a feeling like he's got a little control. Um, see, man, it still really feels like it's hitting a wall, which doesn't look that good. And I think we need to stretch this out even more because it should feel so subtle. All right, we're gonna call that good for now. Now the squash and stretch looks pretty bad, but why? Why does it look so bad? So it looks bad because I think we're easing into this we're easing into this pose too much. It should be a lot more sudden because the floor, right? Like it's gonna feel smoother. So I was easing into this pose and that's, a, yeah, a huge difference already. Now it looks, looks a little too fast. I'm gonna grab these three keyframes, slide them out, then grab these four keyframes, slide it out again. See if I can't see if I can't massage that out. See, it already looks a lot better. A lot of it just tends to be timing, which means um, you know the amount of frames uh, and spacing. Obviously, is the interpolation between the frames, but the overall timing. If you look at an animation, you're like, oh boy, that looks terrible. It tends to be tends to be timing. So that landing. See, now it almost seems a little too, now it seems a little too slow. The other thing too, to always be aware of that I'm, that I'm definitely learning over time is watching the playback speed in the viewport. Sometimes things can look a little different when they're rendered out, like as a hardware preview or actually rendering out the frames. Um, so for my money, it's like getting the animation as good as I possibly can to see this in real time. And it's not telling me it's playing back at a slower speed, um, but I sometimes don't always, I feel like there can be a little bit of a, of a difference sometimes. So our little overshoot on the rotation isn't great, but it's not terrible. He that looks a little, looks a little sudden. So that is that rotation layer, hit H. You know, is it because I broke that tangent? Could have something to do with that. So I'm gonna use two to really, really, really zoom in here and look at that. I've got an overshoot the other direction that I couldn't even tell at the previous scale. And you know, it, it is a little bit broken. Yeah, I think it, we just needed to ease it. Well, Jesus. 
It's not terrible. I just don't want it to feel like he's hitting a wall in midair with the rotation. It should feel a little more like someone controlling their body, which would probably be a little bit slower, but I've made it about as slow as I can with our overall time. He doesn't even reach back to the front position until he's getting into that squash. Um, well, let's ease it a little bit more. I mean, that looks pretty darn smoothed. So it's, it's quite cartoony. Let me turn off the world axis. Sorry, y'all. And let me turn off the grid. We don't need to see that. So it feels a little bit sluggish on the final bounce. Um, I'm going to hit H again. One thing that is useful is, let's say we have this squash and stretch, and I've got this decay. I think it feels a little sluggish. You can just use your your mouse cursor and create this box, right? Drag and click, kind of like you would in After Effects if you're an After Effects user. Um, is it offset from the peak height? Yeah, I'll come back to that in a moment, Chris. Um, the other thing you can do though, oops, uh, and this is good, but you can you can only move these um, just like as a unit, if that makes sense. We do have the um, the region tool very helpfully. The keyboard shortcut is R. And the region tool is behaves a little bit more um, usefully. Basically what it'll do is I can make that same selection, but then I'm left with a bounding box that I can, uh, oops, that I can manipulate almost like, you know, like a Photoshop uh, bounding box, or even, you know, an After Effects shape layer where you can, you can stretch and squeeze. Um, you could squeeze this direction. You can squeeze this direction. So we're, you know, if you're feeling like, well, you know, that decay is a little bit sluggish, instead of moving each one individually, you can just grab the end of the bounding box and say, well, let's tighten that up a bit. And you can see I've got the default setting where I can't have keyframes in between frames, so it's doing this snapping, and that would certainly require some cleanup. Um, and if you want to get rid of the region tool, you hit R again, and it deactivates. So that is a useful way to stretch your timing um, in a really in a really easy and simple way, which is certainly good. Good to know as you get into more complicated animation. So is it offset from peak height? Chris was probably asking that when we were working on our rotation, um, the actual rotation of bow here. Is it offset from peak height? No, I have him reaching peak height all about the same time. Maybe a little bit offset would make that feel better, but I'm feeling a little bit better about But again, okay, our landing, our decay doesn't look nearly doesn't look nearly as crisp as the rest of the animation. It starts to get sluggish. So the question is, why is that so sluggish? Is it just that first bounce? Yeah, I think it's largely the first bounce. Um, so let's speed it up slightly. And I'm not going to use the region tool. I'm just going to. I'm just going to do that. I think the first bounce just felt sluggish. Suddenly that feels a lot better actually because the last little the last little wobble is pretty quick. It's just a couple of keyframes. Um, and I was coming in here and breaking tangents. Um, ease out, ease in. If I come back and just say ease, ease, it's gonna ease on both ends and it'll convert that. Now I can always go back and hold shift and break this tangent again and then come back and say you know, ease, ease, and you get this, right? You get the tangent is back performing um, how you would expect it to, to perform there. And so that's looking a lot better. You know, it's a fun challenge. I would definitely recommend, like if you're totally new to it, just get a bounce loop going, but then give yourself a challenge like this of like, take your bounce and make the character stop do some kind of antic, as it's known in animation, some kind of comedic action or some action in the middle of the shot, um, and then maybe like 
come back and do do another animation. So let's actually do that same kind of thing. It's good to it's good to do that as well because there's the basic timing in animation, which is like, okay, let's get the bounce timing and the decay timing and all that figured out. But then generally, if you have some goal for a shot, there's like the shot timing, right? And trying to massage out the actions of the character. Um, you know, as in as in this example, we don't need. We don't need all that. So, you know, even even copy my shot, like give uh, give Bo something to jump off of. That's maybe like a cool way, you know, add a little bit of interest to the scene or just give yourself a little bit of an obstacle course. Um, and then I just thought it would be fun to try like a screen exit kind of animation, which I think is which is like another good principle um, to try to think about and improve on is you know, we gave, um, we, we didn't want to just build a ball that was like, you know, a, a gymnasium ball. We wanted him to have a face so that you're forced to orient the character to the camera. So this becomes that principle of staging in animation. Um, that is really common of like, if it's just a ball, well then yeah, just make it bounce. But if it's a character and he has a face then you have to be a little bit more conscious of what the viewer is seeing from the camera angle. Um, so that is why we went a little bit above and, and just uh, gave him a very, very, very simple face just so that he could be oriented, um, oriented to the camera so that we have to kind of consider that, that blocking. So I feel pretty good about that animation. That's pretty cool. The decay could use some work, certainly. Um, so let's add some more. Let's go up to 120. I'm going to double this. Now you've seen the basics. Um, we should be able to animate pretty quickly. So I'm going to come back into here. No deformation. I definitely want to hold. So Command-C, Command-V. I'll select this one and Option-L. Hmm. I That should be working. I guess you have to select both. Excuse me. Um, so alt L to linear those out. So I basically have a stepped keyframe and this is where we can decide on our timing. He comes here. Um, and this is where I'll hold shift. This is where we can decide, is there an antic? Should he do a rotate? Should he do a blink? Just for the sake of this, um, let's quickly add an antic, that same kind of rotational thing that I was doing. So we'll come back into rotate. I'll we'll just add a keyframe there. Um, then I'm just gonna more organically pose him using that. Um, but I really gotta make sure that I also have keyframes for those other parameters. And excuse me, I need to come into rotate. Let's just look at rotate. So those are all frozen out. Now I can just should just be able to grab this organically and work on a pose. There we go. He goes that way. We'll kind of ease him in. Then he looks this way. Set some more keyframes. Then let's have him. Um, come back here, come back, look at the viewer. And if I don't have any hold keyframes there, that's just going to look like one big bobblehead movement, which is not what we want, but we can go back in and using our interpolation, make those feel a little bit more like holds without adding a ton of keyframes. I think that's possible. I just want to block it in. And you know, real real feature film animator types, they uh, they are typically always working in like a stepped blocking mode long before they ever um, get into like F curves and try to try to massage anything out. So he's like sh -sh -sh -sh, that way, that way. Then he needs to come back and look screen 
screen right, my right, his left. Uh, I'll set another keyframe. So the other, you know, another nice animation principle we should think about is, you know, when we do a head turn, we always have to think about curves. We very rarely just mechanically rotate our head. We kind of like look down as we rotate our head. Um, so that's something that we can kind of, kind of give him. And just if that, if that sounds like pure craziness, this is a better example. that he looks this way. You can see my timing is actually kind of shitty there. <laughs> the slightest head tilt down. You see, I, I did it a lot better on the second one. Instead of just rotating him totally across, he's got that little bit of arc with the nose, with the nose coming down, and then a little bit of a, a little bit of a bounce out of there. So always a good thing to remember. We're not robots, we don't move totally mechanically so that's that's all gonna have to be fixed and then we're gonna come here and so for now we're okay with the rotation um, let me go ahead and put a camera in the scene I'm gonna move away from it but I just want to get a little bit closer and I should probably be doing this more since you all are watching um, on a live stream and it's probably not the suit it's not super clear so that's going to look like a big weird head bobble let's come back into our rotation so he comes here what we really want is for him to to kind of lean back a little bit kind of come into a pose like this. That's gonna make all that even worse. And then I wanna to come to the master controller. I'll try to go a little quicker now. And we're going to first, let's come back here and set a keyframe at zero, just so we're holding we're holding the lack, actually we don't need to add one, do we? We just need to shift control this one out. So we have our, our total stepped hold there. And here, we wanna start this. We wanna add that anticipation. Where then after a couple frames, he's gonna be on his way. And then the next thing we can do is come back to that bounce layer, hit H, go to the bounce layer. And again, we just need to make sure there's a hold so we're not interpolating all the way, right? It's gonna have to hold basically to here. So if I Command C, Command V, grab these two and Option L, Alt L, that's gonna create a hold. I'm gonna hold down one to move that around. And now we need to move out a little bit. I guess we should definitely think about what the camera's seeing. And he needs to really pop out of there, right? Um, so make sure I've got the bounce layer. I'm gonna Command C, Command V, and just do it all right here in the graph editor. Grab these, say easy E, so I can uh, control that. Pull this down, but generally speaking, right, we want it to feel like he he pops up. So again, it's going to be this kind of, and that's too fast. And going straight up might feel extreme. One thing I've also had to learn is just kind of the the difference between um, like visually how the curves look in After Effects and Cinema 4D and then the way it behaves. I feel like in After Effects, you can stand, you know, a tangent almost straight up and it doesn't seem as bad. In Cinema, 
it just feels like it'll just like strobe across the scene sometimes. You can run into that. Um, I should probably be checking the YouTube comments as well. Uh, but we are trying to get this, um, and please let me know if this chat experience isn't very good. We're testing out kind of a, this new page and this new um, chat system that Matthew's building for us here, um, just so that we can contextualize live streams like this and make sure everybody has access to resources and stuff instead of just doing it on, on YouTube. Um, yeah, so this is it, right? Okay, we're going to have to go back, fix all that get this bounce going. So the other thing I want to do then is come to the master control and just zero in on the X position, let's say. Master control, bring up the coordinates. I'll lay a keyframe for the X position and then I'm gonna do this animation. You see he just flies through the sky and goes from the ground <laughs> to that high up. Move that up a little bit. Leap tall buildings in a single bound. Let's actually pull that back. That's a little bit crazy. So the other thing we can do is on this rotate, although we went a little bit crazy, that's okay. We can fix all that. Um, I really want him to feel like he's tilting back a little bit more. Where's that control? Not that one. Is it going to be this bank control? That's a little bit more side to side. I guess it's this pitch control. And I need to zoom out holding two. Sometimes when I'm if I'm looking at charts uh, or F curves and I see something like that, I'll typically delete it. I'll make sure. Um, Actually, we're going to have to build some holds, so I'm not going to delete that just yet. So yeah, he's kind of leaning back. I want him to feel like he's leaning back as he's squashing, actually. That's kind of the important thing to me. I like that pose. And then I want him... So maybe we can afford to let that breathe a little bit more. As he gets here... I'm going to command C, command V. I do want it to feel like he's leaning forward, like he's moving his inertia forward. So I'm going to tilt him forward a bit, like so. So that he could kind of, then as he's going through to the next bounce, if we were going to build a next bounce, um, it would be cool to have him feel like he's rotating back so he wants his feet to meet the, you know, to meet the ground and that would need to be kind of on the next on the next bounce oops don't delete your whole animation oh just want to delete a single keyframe by selecting it and deleting and um so there's a lot of work to be done still with this animation we're going to keep this live stream to an hour um but if you have any questions, let's chat. I'm going to hang out for a few minutes here. Alexa, play steel drum music. Play steel drum music. I've been listening to a good deal of uh, tropical music. Alexa, volume level two. Um, but thank you for hanging out. Thank you for testing the page. Someone give me some feedback on this chat system. Is this thing working for y'all? Um, or is everybody just on YouTube watching it? Seems decently quiet there. Um, so I would say, grab these grab these free rigs if you like. Um, for our next live stream, now that if if we think this is working, we got to kind of work out some few kinks. Um, we'll take a stab at doing. We already did the walk cycle, which you can see is pretty easy did this in maybe just three or four hours. 
And it looks like his head control... Oh, Joey built some espresso into that. Oh, he's connecting. I see. <laughs> I don't think I added any. I did not. I did not add any squash and stretch on that walk cycle. What am I doing? Hold command to move that. Oops. Or just destroy the rig, if you like. Um, you know, this one's great because you can just focus on the legs and the body and not have to worry about arms. Um, we are attempting to book Joey to build a version two of this guy where he has, he's got some tube arms. I'm struggling with the hands a little bit, thinking kind of a mitten, um, but that'll be coming soon. You all, you all can play with that too whenever we get that done and put that up in the workshops page. Um, let me close this down. Cool. Works, works. Um, yeah, so grab grab these rigs. Feel free to play around. We are trying to organize a character animation boot camp, kind of like a, you know, a six or an eight week thing where we give you some assignments. We do some live time together, uh, you know, recruit some really, really, really hardcore character animators um, to come in because it's a super good skill. And, you know, I think Joey Judkins would tell you you know, the demand for people doing character work in cinema specifically is really huge because not that many people do it, in part because there's not that many rigs to play with and learn on. So you'll see a lot of studios that would otherwise be using Cinema 4D for everything have to bring in Maya people and build characters in Maya when they want to do character stuff. And um, if you're in the MoGraph world, you see character stuff just being way, way more present in our line of work, in our industry. And now, you know, the term motion design, which is not a super helpful term or MoGraph because it's so broad, not a super helpful term. Uh, the line is kind of blurring where, well, you're an animator, you do this text animation, hey, animate a character. Um, that line is blurring. So if you have a passion to do this kind of work, um, you know, I think it's a really, really good time to be working on that kind of stuff. Um, and adding it to your portfolio. And you know, we did some we did some shading and stuff on these specifically so that if you made a cool animation, um, you get this scene file where I make myself, um, I call it my purple box, where I've got my infinite psych wall on a background and a floor because I'm using a compositing tag to basically delete, uh, you know, blend out the edges of the floor. And then I've got this, um, I've got this material that is, um, that's just a gradient, right? It's just a, a two dimensional gradient. So you can change the colors. You can change the colors on him. Let me amp those, that, those samples up a bit. And I gave him, um, you know, a little bit of a lizardy kind of skin. It is on a bump map. Um, and you know, we didn't even talk about the eye rig on this guy, then we'll, we'll certainly get into that. But um, yeah, grab the scene, turn on global illumination, make something dope, change the colors, do whatever you want, render it out. And if you can start sneaking that stuff into your portfolio, if it looks good enough, um, if you wanna really make yourself available for that kind of work, it's, it's not a bad idea at all. And it should render super fast, right? Like. I am on an iMac Pro now, so that's going to be pretty quick to render. Um, okay, if anybody has any questions, I'll hang out for a second. But other than that, thanks for hanging out. I hope that um, I hope that everybody's doing okay. This is totally nuts. It sounds like we're all going to be spending a lot of time inside. Uh, over the next few months. So a good time to play with free resources, a good time to work on your reel, work on your portfolio, learn something new. Um, man, if I had if I had more time, I would definitely um, maybe check out that Houdini course that's making the rounds. Um, you know, I, I obviously recommend our own uh, our own courses, of course. 
Um, but yeah, just check out, we've built a kind of new resource page that we just wanted to get it in place so that we can add a lot more to it. There's a kind of mouth rig scene file you can grab in there. Um, the C40 scene file archive, right now it only has two things in it. It's super bare, but that's gonna be a super exciting category um, as I hit up all my C4D friends and beg them to give us free scene files <laughs> that we can look at and tear apart. Um, and yeah, if, if you're into, if you're trying to get into 3D animation, but you're a C4D user, then that's why we put, that's why we put this together. Um, new workshop out today, stylized characters in Blender. Remington is on the team now, super, super talented guy. I've learned a lot from him already about Blender. What an incredible tool. Um, and then Paul's class just came out a few weeks ago, but man, we're just seeing people make absolutely stunning models. Um, and you'll see a lot of, a little bit of the student work here, um, which looks really dope. So if you're trying to, I really like this treatment. Who did this one? Ash. Super fun, super fun style and kind of a viz dev treatment there. Um, so let's see. So no questions, everybody have a great Wednesday. Um, thank you so much for hanging out, checking out the stream. First of many, we're trying to get all the kinks worked out. You see my new hashtag, hashtag Florida man set here. Um, yeah, hit us up, let us know. You know, we're in the midst of developing a lot of new courses and um, yeah, Taylor been doing some really beautiful work out of Paul's course. Um, yeah, let us know what kind of training you, you all are interested to, you know, we're here, we have our core program, we have our nine month program, which is like people who really, you know, want to go from kind of zero to a hundred on process on being an art director, uh, being a creative director, doing kind of all aspects of a project, right? We have that, that was the original inception of MoGraph mentor. Um, but we also see that we just want to create training that's more specialized for people already in the industry, right? Like if you just want to learn something incredibly niche, you know, if you really love Sarah Wong's illustration work, there's a workshop there, um, you know, Colin's directing. We've got a couple more on the, on the editing timelines. These have already been filmed, the intro to Adobe Animate um, and this 2D character design course, which is going to be super dope. Uh, and Handel. The busiest man in the industry. I swear this one's getting closer though. <laughs> um, texturing characters. So yeah, so Paul who did the modeling course is already, he's off and running on a UV texturing course. Um, and man, what a, what a rabbit hole UV stuff is, but it is certainly an important thing. If you want to learn how to texture characters, um, just doing the UV on anything really like learn that process. Um, unfortunately cinema, it's very likely that you're going to want a third party tool. And Paul is, is looking at which one exactly is going to be the final one he recommends, but Rhizom, I believe it's called, um, or other, other kind of UV unwrapping tools. But that's another kind of rabbit hole that's super valuable to learn, um, that, you know, especially if you're if you're doing 3D and you want to build obviously extremely custom shaders for your work, then you got to learn how to UV, how to UV the stuff. Um, and the tough part about UVing, like as opposed to hard surface modeling, you know, with hard surface modeling, there's like seven to ten techniques and like five or six best practices. And once you know that, it's like kind of scientific. Um, there's certainly some, you know, on the fly problem solving when it comes to modeling, but like UVing as I'm learning from people like Paul is often hyper specific to each model. And so it's a little bit more of a technical creative problem solving part of our workflow potentially. Um, so hopefully we can create just a ton of clear training on that because it is quite important. Um, yeah, the UV editor in cinema is not is not the greatest. This is where maybe Blender has a little bit of an advantage on stuff like that. Uh, Slowbo, playing with Bo at the moment. Dope, good stuff, man. 
Might watch some Maya to learn the next, the, learn the basics for character animation next. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously a million character animation uh, tutorials out there, and just literally, it does start with the animation principles, um, and then really learning how to work with the rigs and like choosing the software, whether it's going to be Maya or C4D. Um, of where you're gonna really work on that stuff. So, I don't see any questions. Um, we'll see everybody next time. Thank you for hanging out. Uh, wash your hands. Stay safe out there. Uh, sadly, it looks like conference, everything's just canceled for the next several months, which is such a bummer. So, um, maybe we can make 2020 a good, uh, a good year for learning and getting better and all of us updating our portfolios and trying to make some cool stuff. Um, since we won't won't be going out a ton. So um, thanks, everybody. Check out the website. We will see you guys later.